Hi, I'm Archana Lamitani. I have a doctorate in environmental epidemiology and have 15 plus of experience in public health research programs and consultations domestically and internationally, and have experience of work in academic, nonprofit, and government settings. Currently, I work in policy area and provide technical knowledge and directions to inform science policy decisions. I'm very passionate when it comes to working with data and have a strong background in big data management and analytics and application of statistical models in health outcomes and epidemiological research. I joined the Women Data Professional Content Team two years back, and I helped the team in capturing stories of accomplished women leaders via Spotlight interview platform and other avenues. Now passing on to Prasasti. Thank you, Archana. Hi, everyone. This is Prashasti. The right way to say my name is Prashasti. Uh, I have been doing data all my adult life. I have been a chief data officer for a couple of Fortune 100 companies like HSBC and lastly with Silicon Valley Bank. Data is my passion and I do not want to experiment out of it ever. Um, leading teams across the globe, I truly am uh, in the forefront believing in diversity and inclusion and other activities. And that was one of the reasons why I joined WDP. I'm heading the WDP uh, contents team and we do a lot of um, involvements, activities and things like that with the team in order to promote women, motivate women and be more inclusive. So before we go and introduce our guest for the day, let me give you a brief overview of what this WDP is. It's Women Data Professional. It's a group and a part of an organization called EDM Council. Our mission is to create a community that supports women in the field of data and assist in their development and promotion to leadership roles. We inspired the future generations of women to we highlight the and celebrate the accomplishments of senior female executive leaders and thereby help the female community in data and technology. Thank you, Prasasti. So with that brief background on WDP, let's move on introducing our guest who is here with us today. As a part of this spotlight interview series, we are very excited to have Jennifer Agnes. Jennifer is the Managing Director of Sinizer US Group, a data and analytics strategy consultancy helping businesses create a better future for all through the open and positive use of data. Her extensive global experience includes roles as the Group Chief Data Officer at Snyder Electric, Chief Data Officer for Risk and Finance at Credit Suisse, and Risk Leader, Managing Director, and several senior leadership roles in commercial real estate, Six Sigma and enterprise data management and reporting during her 20 years at GE Capital. She was recently named to Data IQ's top 100 US most influential people in data and CDO Magazine's top data consultants in 2022. She's also a certified executive coach helping data leaders around the world succeed in this important endeavor. Welcome, Jennifer. We are very happy to have you with us today. Thank you, Arshana and Prashasti. Glad to be here. So Jennifer, we would like to start with a surprise icebreaker, okay. if you don't mind. Can you like just imagine you have nothing to do with data and technology? What would you like to be famous for? Like imagine having a few million Instagram users, but not in data and technology? Uh, that's um, an easy one for me. No one's ever asked me that, but it's a pretty easy one. Um, but it does tie to what I spend a lot of my time on, and that is um, helping people reach their highest potential, no matter what they're doing. It doesn't have to be in data and analytics or anything like that or technology, but really working with people to just make sure they are thriving in what they want to thrive in, whatever the area is. So I spend a lot of time in that. Um, I do it a lot with data and technology people, but I also do it outside of that as well. And, and that goes to family and friends and, and all of that because, you know, you only live once. Awesome. Thank you. What an amazing answer was yes. that. I mean, we all tried for that, right? Like I think yeah. even 
folks in women lead a professional group and that resonates so well with us. Thank you, Jennifer, for that. Sure. So let's get started, actually. Oh, Jennifer, can you tell us a little bit about your current roles and responsibilities and how long have you been in this role? Yeah, sure. Happy to. Um, so my current role is, as you mentioned, Arshna, the, um, I'm the managing director for Synager in the U.S., which is a data and analytics and AI strategy um, consultancy. Um, I started that role, uh, pro I guess it was in the end of 2020, um, when, uh, you know, sort of COVID happened. Remember COVID? That wasn't all that long ago, but it seems a long time ago. But really, that was a silver lining for me, being able to work from home, find a company I really wanted to work for, and, and shift from corporate life, where you had already mentioned, I spent 20 years at GE Capital, I was at Credit Suisse, I was at Schneider Electric, um, move from the corporate world into the consultancy world and try my hand at that. Um, so that really the, the COVID era allowed me to work for this UK company who I had met through my career, um, in Europe, um, and basically pick up, um, some gigs to start with, but ultimately launch the U S business for them. Um, and in addition to that, um, being accountable for building the U S business and our brand here in the U S, um, most recently was, um, ha have a new significant role at the company, which is global coaching and development for the company. So internally for our team to become a self-learning organization and, and better ourselves, but also to promote that and build that um, competency, if you will, and, and offer that to our clients, um, either as part of the engagements that we have, or as, you know, one-on-one -on -one coaching that I, that I do um, spend a lot of my time on. Um, so it really gets to marry up my sweet spot with data and analytics, having done it for so long and then helping people uh, get better at what they want to do. So, yeah, I've been there for, I guess, four years, almost four years now, three and a half years. So, And is that the best part about your job or is there something else more that you would say are some of the bestest part of your job on a day to day basis? Well, what's great about consulting, and I didn't know this because I'd never been really a consultant outside of corporate space before, um, is the diversity of talent, the diversity of um, activities and projects you can work on, the diversity of cultures. And you mentioned it earlier, Prashasti, right? This We live in a very diverse uh, world um, and being in a corporate environment and you know, Prashasti, we met at GE, right? At GE yeah. Capital, we spent some time together. So you're in a in a company that has its culture and its behaviors, and that's where you learn. Um, but seeing and moving into other corporations and other um, environments and cultures, you know, I've been working a really long time, but that's been really fantastic and eye opening to learn so much about other industries that I hadn't been in, or you know, just see the the wealth of talent just in Synergy alone. The people that I work with are just amazing experience and willing to share and teach. Um, and then the clients and the and the industries and sectors we work with and the new products, of course, that are coming out and technologies that are coming out. And um, that's really been, it's been a huge learning experience moving into consulting, which, you know, you think you're going into consulting to advise people on what you know, but in fact, it's been quite reciprocal in terms of me learning, um, you know, as much as I've tried to help other people learn. Yeah, that sounds really exciting. And, uh, you know, I have not worked in consulting a lot, but with projects that have been outside of cross borders, they have always been very exciting for me. So is this the phase that you would consider in your entire career graph, the most exciting project or exciting phase or do you recall any other phase, maybe early on or any time in your career, which you think has been the most exciting project so far that you have worked on? I think it goes in stages, right? So when you're just coming out of school and you get your first job and you're learning, there's things that are exciting in that type of environment. Um, I think in retrospect, you know, you learn over these years, but I think in retrospect, there's there's a couple significant projects that I worked on that I think I'm, I'm really glad we did. Some of them were at GE. One in particular where um, I was running um, a global risk and data operations team. Um, so I was in GE real estate at the time, very big uh, part of GE capital. 
And we needed to transition from a very archaic um, valuation technology for valuing, you know, corp, you know, buildings around the globe, assets that we had around the globe. And we had to shift from, you know, I think we had something like $90 billion worth of real estate, which is lots and lots of real estate. We had to shift from one system to another, the valuations, which if you know about real estate, there's, it's just tons of data about the building, the size, the net, the gross, the rates, the steps, the leases, the content, the, the, the types of um, tenants that you have, the buyers that you have, the sellers that you have. So it's just, it's data rich, which is really where a lot of the data work I did at GE happened. And we had to transition, move, migrate, not just simply migrate, but redesign and pick a new system and move $90 billion worth of real estate from one system to the next without accounting issues, without loss of valuation, right? So it was, and I was lucky enough to have an amazing project manager um, on that program at the time. And without her, it wouldn't have been successful for sure. But um, our team was uh, global, working Australia, Japan, Europe, all around the globe where all the assets were. And making that successful was a very, very big data, let's say, project, if you will, but business value project that that really set the trajectory for, for GE real estate going forward. Um, but then I would say, so that's sort of the data part of it that was really exciting and, and very stressful and you know very hard, but still really great looking back at it. And then today, when I look at things, I, I really like what I'm doing today in, in the aspects of, um, of coaching and culture, data culture, which in the past, and I would say almost pre-COVID, um, was sort of not okay to talk about, like culture, it's fluffy, it's soft, it's, what do you mean by that? That's not it, show me a dashboard, I'd rather have a dash, whatever, right? I think we've seen it, if you, you probably Google or chat GPT, how many times cult, the word data culture is used now, we see a lot more about that conversation. But um, at Synergy, I've put together with my colleagues um, an approach to culture that I wouldn't have known if I hadn't gone through all of the things we, we've all been through, right? And um, we call that this CLEAR framework, um, which stands for communicate, lead, educate, act, and relate, which are sort of all of the facets of creating a culture, because within each of those, um, there's a ton of work that is required to, and, and it's a 360, right? It's a holistic look at how do you adapt, change, innovate in a culture so that people become, it becomes part of their DNA, it becomes how they operate, it becomes how they think. It's not a day job, almost like let's work ourselves out of a role. We don't need a data person anymore. We need to behave data versus hire somebody to do data to us, right? And so that's sort of the transformational look at this model that I've created there with this acronym called CLEAR and a framework that we have. A lot of it is based on, you know, sort of behavioral psychology, right? Like each of these aspects, you can think about um, things like, you know, learning, co social learning, like you see other people do it, you're going to, you know, you're going to start emulating that. It's kind of how we got into the situations we were in the past where you see belligerent bosses and you're like, oh, that's the model I'm going to do. And, and, and that's sort of, you know, very old school um, and so this this starts to demonstrate different ways of learning and and how to educate and how to um, motivate differently because we know to your you mentioned it earlier the diversity piece is huge right people learn differently and not just diversity of gender but diversity of learning diversity of of um, experience um, culture all of all of that kind of thing so it's almost like you know kind of like if you will. Um, diversity times two. So you've got diversity, equity, and inclusion, but here we're thinking about it as, you know, data expectations and insights. You can think of it like DEI as well, right? Because it's about the data. It's the expectations people have on you and you place on others without overtly talking about what you mean by that. What do you need by it from that? And then of course the insights and the actions you get out of that, which are, you know, um, gravitational almost, the positive things you do, even if they're little projects that you deliver and products you're delivering along the way, you get that gravitational pull where people go, oh, what are they doing? I'd like to be part of that, right? So that starts to change the enthusiasm and the interest and the, yeah, you always get naysayers and people that are going to try to get in your way. But part of that is really making 
making it okay to show up at work with your whole self and be yourself at work now versus coming in and oh, I'm just the data guy and I'm just going to stick in my box, but really start to explore the the value that everybody can contribute in their own small or large way, depending on their, you know, what they want to do. So, so the, 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 to your point, I guess the, the answer to the question is yes, I've got a big data project that I thought was fantastic. And what I think fantastic now is that I'm actually able to pull all of those things I've done for years together, the data piece, the relationships piece, the communication piece, the leadership piece, the education piece, and package that up in a way that I think uh, resonates with today's world and the people that we're working with today. Mm, thank you for sharing the CLEAR clear framework. I took notes actually. <laughs> thank you for that. You yeah. Welcome. So what about like, can you recollect a time when, you know, you're doing what is needed to be done yet you have a very alpha or a very difficult person on the other end and it's challenging to walk through, work through that barrier. Like, how it, can you recollect a time like that? And is there something that you did to overcome it and be successful? Like, I'm talking more both culture as, as well as like, you know, roadblocks maybe from an um, technology or data standpoint, both ways or either yeah. ways. I'm sure you both have experienced that as well, right? And I'm not to lead the witness, but yeah, I mean, we we learn we learn and experience a diverse uh, leadership and managers across you know the the many years that we've been working, um, and that's been a learning experience over the years as well, right? The first time that happens to you, where someone talks over you or <laughs> ignores your idea or goes, oh. I just came up with a great idea, which is the idea you just said, but they took it type of thing, which is fine. Now I'm like, ideas are free. You go for it. Um, <laughs> when, when that happens and, and it happens often. And I think recognizing that is happening is the first thing versus it being a personal thing, which is how I probably used to take it and get probably much more worked up about it. I think today, you know, growing through so many different organizations and experiences and different leaders that I've worked for and managers um you you have to be able to take a deep breath and realize that it's often not about you it's it's their way of operating their way of showing power way of showing intelligence and people are motivated in different ways um and i think if you can recognize that maybe you don't understand what's making them tick but you can see something is different you, you sort of just let them tick and and you are there to, I always call it the mirror test. If you are there for the right reasons and you are talking about things that you believe in that are important, they can choose not to listen to you. But if you profoundly believe this is what's important and you need to express it in a way that is constructive, then you have every right, just like everybody else to express that. And, and getting to that mental state for me Take, took me a long time. I can certainly share that and um, having the confidence to say, I'm not doing this for me to look great. I'm doing this because you. I'm part of this team or I'm leading this team or you asked for my opinion or you didn't ask for my opinion, but I have one and I should share it because I've had experiences that are different than yours. Their reaction to that is sort of on them. It's not on you. That's how they've either been threatened or, you know, they feel threatened or they feel undermined. Not that you presented it that way, but their own mental behaviors might make them think that. And so they're going to bully or react negatively. Or many of my managers and leaders are like, that's a great idea. Let's go. Well, what do you mean by that? Right. Who else can help you? How can I help? That kind of thing. So um, I like to, I like to be in environments that are much more creative and consult, you know, and um, constructive that way. So, you know, the older I get, the more I like to pick and choose who I work with, because that's, that's where you get your satisfaction and, and happiness by, you know, blending like we do today, work and work in life, basically work and home. Um, you know, you really want to make sure that you're, you're happy. So yeah. you get that choice, you should be able to make that choice and express what's working and what's not working. Um, and make a decision to to change if you want to. Um, but it takes a while. It takes a lot of thinking to work at that, right? Self-awareness, awareness of others, maybe some 
imposter syndrome help type of thing. You know, <laughs> I don't know if you guys have talked about that in the past on um, on your uh, on many of your interviews, but those are things that take a while to reshape your mental models. Only, only an seasoned executive could answer this question this well, like from a qualitative standpoint. So thank you. I'm definitely very impressed with this answer. Yes. Welcome. No, I appreciate it. I think it's amazing. Uh, Jennifer, just a follow up, you know, like, I mean, you mentioned about the clear strategy you use and the, so that, you know, like you can bring in the aspect of data, expectations, insights, like bringing in different data culture, right, into that and adapting it to the uh, different needs uh, of meeting the needs of people globally. So uh, along that line, I know it's easy to say, like, especially for the youngsters, right? Like who are trying to adapt more to these global environments. Do you have any specific examples you can give like in terms of the challenges and how you have overcome it when you come across uh, like things like pushbacks or things that people at the other end doesn't get it, right? So how do you come across those? Like, what do you suggest for those emerging leaders who want to go more globally and work in the global space? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of little tactics, I think. So there's the mental setup that I just sort of described in the last part of this, but there's a lot of tactics you can take um, if you have the mental mindset to do it. But you, part of it is realizing that everybody doesn't listen. I mean... <laughs> A lot of people can't, right? You don't know where they stand or what they have on their mind when you come into any meeting, event, one-on-one, -on -one, whatever that is. So, you know, you kind of show up and you think they're on this same page as you, but you think about yourself. Sometimes you've got something going on and you come to an event or in a meeting and there's something going on in the back of your head. So you're not giving it your full attention. So that's one thing to recognize is that not everybody is meeting you at exactly where you think they are where you expect, again, expectancy, like where you expect them to be. You've got to figure out almost bespoke ways to get certain populations or certain personas maybe, and eventually that becomes a human, like a person, but a persona to, to see where, um, where their head is at and then try to find the language and the examples that will make them perk up and listen. So if you're on a big, you know, a big stage and you're presenting something, you can rest assured, like not everybody's listening and they're not going to remember much of what you say, which is why, you know, there's all these stats about how to present and, you know, what, what part is retained and that kind of thing. You have to say something seven times to have it remembered. Um, but that's in a big audience. So you can't really manage how people, again, take that in as you move to smaller and smaller groups. Managing teams is one thing, like making sure teams understand why they're working together. So if you're a, a, a team manager, a young team manager, one of the best things I think you can do, and part of this is, again, team coaching aspects of this, like how do you get your team to be high performing? That's another thing, part of the coaching world here. But um, having the team understand why that team is together, not individually, but collectively, what objectives are you achieving or what are the you know, what are the um, streams of work that you've got within your organization? Why are they shoved together under you? Like, wh what is the purpose of that? Now, some of it might not make any sense to you. And, and it's okay to say that I just had to take that on. And that's just a side job. But in data space, especially if you're running the, um, you know, the business engagement team, or the people that are interfacing with the business leaders, or if you're running the platform team, or if you're running the engineering team, there's a real reason why you all sit together, and how that stream and that flow works together. But if you're just one person who comes into that team and doesn't appreciate or have it been told or learned why you're all sitting together, it becomes very um, hard to express to anybody else what you're doing. So they don't see the picture. And, and again, you learn that I think over time that you're not just an individual contributor, even if you are, there are things happening adjacent to you that impact what you're doing and what they're doing. And you've got to realize that you're part of a system. Right. This is part of the the system that you're in, whether it's a data system or a people system, it's a system. Um, and so a leader, if you're a young leader and you want to get your team to get that, like you have that conversation with them and you do that over time where you almost ask them why they're together and have them create that reason to be together. Why do I need to work with you? Why do I need to tell you this? Why do you need to listen to me? So you can build the story and then that story becomes something you can share 
um, outside of your little bubble of where you're working on and get people to hear it. And that lets you see different perspectives and articulate in the, in the C part of, 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 um, of clear communicating is not just spitting it out there and, and like in a big audience and hoping they retain it because they won't. It's understanding your audience, small or large, and finding that hook because you understand their role and, and you're trying to get them to understand your role, but they won't understand it because a lot of times, you know, data is just like last thing they're thinking about. So you've got to find the hook, the value. The, this is where you get into what's in it for them. It's not about what's in it for me as the data person. I'm not there to say, hey, I'm the chief data officer. I'm leading this data team. It's about I am here because I know you need this information to make what you have to produce successful. And then you got to find the language to do that. Um, that is a really long answer, maybe Arshana, sorry, but that's kind of, that's how I think about it. So it's, it's, it starts, you know, big and you can be a team leader, you can be an individual contributor, but understanding the ecosystem that you're in and the, having that perspective helps contribute to um, the messaging. And, and I'd say the other part of that is it helps you build relationships because it's often useful not to only, not to be the only messenger of this find other people that will send the same message because sometimes people have blockers. I don't want to hear that person speak. I don't like how she says it. It's whatever bias they've got, find the other way in, right? right? This is a, a multiplier effect. It's, it's, the, it's the R part of clear, relate. What's the relationships? How do they, what are the roles? How do they trust you? What is the community? How do you support each other in a community? Um, I've been in many situations where they just don't want to hear me about it. I'd much rather have the head of marketing say exactly what I told them to say. I have nothing to do with it, but they're like, oh, that's a great idea. That came from marketing. Let's do it. You have it. It's all yours. <laughs> I, I so much agree. I think building that relationship and trust, right? And then understand putting yourself in other speed and like trying to understand the bigger landscape and how these small components like we all work together to achieve the same goal right um definitely works and sometimes i agree that maybe something some ideas coming from a different person may have a completely change the things completely in a different way than coming from you so i think you need to think about that too thank you so much for all that's great uh, insight jennifer so Let's switch our gear a little bit here and uh, hear a little bit about a person who inspires or inspire you and uh, why you admire that person. So thinking more uh, for, uh, like getting into more of your personal experience with that. Yeah, I mean, lots of people inspire me. I, I guess you got to start local like my mom. Uh, right. She was, uh, she is, she's, she's almost 90. She'll be 90 this year. She's a, a nurse by trade. So way, way back when, when we didn't have anything digital, um, did amazing things, worked in the emergency room when we were kids. So having um, perseverance and resilience and be able to get through all of that with, with three kids, uh, quite a role model for me, um, becoming independent and, and uh, you know, working even, right? Having a, a working model at that time. So, um, and working hard and working nights. So, you know, it's sort of like, you, my my mental model on that is, you know, that's how you get ahead. You work hard, you get a great job, you still have a family, right? It's not, I'm not saying it was always perfect, but those are that's kind of the role model they have. And she's she's amazing. She's almost ninety. She still bakes bread every day. You know, she's she's pretty incredible. So start with that. Then I go to my daughters. I have two daughters that are also role models. Uh, one is getting her PhD in, in uh, biomedical engineering, doing amazing things with bone research. Um, and my other daughter is living in Paris and having graduated in the COVID graduation period, uh, really um, Figuring out what to do next when you missed probably two years of what was the what we used to consider the normal life, um, and and being motivated and driven to find something that's going to be her passion. So, I guess I'll start with my my local people, Arshna, if that's an okay response. Yeah. 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 No, that's amazing, right, Prasasti? I think we all have like when we think of a role model, we think somebody older than us, but then there are also younger people we can always learn from. So that's amazing to hear for, about your daughters and how, you know, you you are influenced by what they do. 
So well, are, so I mean, aren't you inspired by the people you work with now? I mean, I, I just had a chat with my husband the other day. What was it about? We were, I just said, wow, everybody's literally younger than us now. And I'm going, <laughs> and I'm inspired by them. It's, it's, you know, the people I work with at Zinnager, people, I, you know, people I meet, people I work out with, whatever I'm there. It's I'm, I'm hopeful for what I see. And I'm, I, I, I keep learning from them as well. And I'm so lucky to be able to be surrounded by this multi-generational um, aspect of things, right? COVID let us do that as well. I think people are working a little longer and differently and you've got, you don't know how old people are anymore. Hopefully if the, if the, if the, um, the blur on the camera is great, you have no idea how, <laughs> how old anybody is, right? If, if Zoom's got their um, wrinkle smoothing thing going there. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it's really our closest that inspire us the most, right? It doesn't have to be a celebrity. I mean, you oh, know, yeah. personally too, I think my closest family is also my inspiration and the biggest inspiration for me. Well, yeah, yeah that's who you get to interact with. I mean, and you ask yes. questions that, or you... You look up to, yes. The, the reality is there, right? Because the role models out there, oh, it's perfect. You know, Instagram perfect or whatever that is. It's not perfect is really what reality is like and that's where you can you can see the ups and downs and it's it's not perfect for anybody but that's how you persevere and 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 build your resilience agree yeah so jennifer you are one of the person who relocated with family to other parts of the world right to accept the yeah. leadership positions during your career which is very very unique uh, not every person get to do that can take on that challenge, right? So considering your experience working in America, Europe, and holding various global leadership positions, uh, can you elaborate on the specific challenges and benefits that emerging women leaders face when you are adapting to new cultural environments? So you are trying to balance your personal life, but then you also want to strive more and do more on your professional life to be succeed, you know, succeed on that area as well. So uh, in, in these diverse setting, uh, what are some of the challenges and benefits you have faced and that the emerging leaders should know that who wants to move in the same path like you did? That's such a good question. And in hindsight, I think it's only benefits. At the time, lots of challenges. But in hindsight, so glad I had those opportunities and that I just said yes to them. Because that's the hardest thing is probably saying yes to them because of all the things that you've got to plan and and figure out before you decide to pack up, you know, your family and kids and move to another country. Um, caveat to that is, you know, moving to a country that I'm familiar with is different than moving to a country I'm not familiar with, right? So if I spoke the language, that makes it a little easier. If I don't speak the language or understand the culture, depending on the adventurous spirit that you've got, you know, yeah, maybe you could move to a, a different country. But I, I think that's part of the consideration um, that you have with your family when you make that decision to move. Like how much adventure do you want? My experience, so my husband's French. I have a French passport. I'm French. My kids speak French. At the time, they didn't. They were little kids. They were 18 months old and, and four years old. But um, my my first um I guess it's not my first one, but the first time with the family was was moving back to France. And um, I had done that independently and that's fun and easy and, you know, go to any country you want. And I know, Prasasti, you're a huge traveler, so you've got tons of stories in this space. Don't don't hesitate to chime in because you've probably got as many experiences as me. But moving the when I made the decision to move my family, I look back on that now and I go, how the heck did I say yes to that? Because I I, I just... But at the time, my my headspace was, this is going to be awesome. How exciting. We get to live in a new country. We get to learn the language. We, uh, I went with rose-colored glasses on, and then they got not so rosy once you get there. So the reality is often very difficult. So you go because you're excited. You want to move to Italy. You want to move to UK, you know, Hong Kong, T Tokyo, whatever. Very exciting because it's probably something in you that you're passionate about and you want to go see and do those things. The reality is it does it does sort of kick you a bit when you, you know, probably a couple months in when it's not as easy to do X, Y and Z or your hours. You know, you have to commit to extensive hours that are different than the ones you're used to. It's not only just getting a new job, probably, which already takes a huge amount of effort when you shift jobs, but 
then shifting your entire family and the culture and you know the groceries and the meals and who's helping you do that. So there is a lot to it. Um, and, and the secret sauce is to have a partner that helps you get that done or more than one partner. Like if you can have somebody who, you know, one of my, uh, one of my GE uh, bosses at the time said to me, Jen, you should outsource the things you won't remember. Like, laundry and stuff like that like i like to cook i don't really like to, i don't mind doing laundry but yeah i'm not going to remember how exciting laundry was every day have somebody do that for you if you can afford it have somebody do that for you don't spend your time on things that you won't remember and um uh and i think that is a pretty wise wise thing to do um so i've tried to try to live by that a lot um and it really you know having people to help help you get through that is important, even back home, so that when you feel homesick, because that inevitably happens, um, you have a way to get back and 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 see people and talk to people. Um, yeah. So there's there's a lot in there. And I'm happy to talk to any uh, anybody one on one about even coach people on on decision on making that decision and the pros and cons of it. I would, you know, my behavior has always been to say yes to those things. I like undefined things that I can then, it's probably my GE learnings, right, Prashasti? We could kind yeah. of create things um, based on what we saw and wanted to make things better. And so my my behavior has always been, I have no idea, but yeah, let's try that and let's see how that comes out. And, and, and in hindsight, yeah, there's always little things in there that are nits or regrets, but nothing material that in hindsight makes me say, I wish I had never done it. I am so glad I had those opportunities. I thank those people every time I think about them um, for those opportunities because uh, yeah, I wouldn't be where I was I am today without a lot of that um, people having confidence in me to even do that, right? Like asking me to go do that. Yeah, I mean, I'm inspired by one of this Russian writers called Nikolai Gogol. He says, basically, life is, you know, we all say life is a journey. It's actually a journey of travel. And all you go to grave with is like experiences, right? Yeah. So it's really, um, you know, good to know. And I totally agree. G had that environment to experiment, fail. It's okay, but you tried. And I think a lot of that DNA was built around that from a professional standpoint. But personally, also, I feel like that's why traveling and trying to solve different challenges from different parts of the world, same challenges, data is data everywhere, but it's looked at it, dealt with in a different manner by different cultures, right? And that's a very, very big experience I think one can have in their lifetime as a profession. And yeah. of course, thousands of benefits personally as well, yeah. Yeah, no, I think you kind of stepping out of your comfort zone and making that decision, it just in itself, right? Amazing. How do you do that? Like, I mean, I am particularly, I'm also very interested in global health work and would like to travel travel internationally and do it. But then when I think back about family, I just say myself, like I resist doing that, right? Making that decision because they're like, I think one of the challenges for me is like thinking about their schools and everything. And so how do you do it? How the kids going to adapt to the culture? So can you also ex uh, like t share a little bit of your experience, more personal experience, like going with the kids? I mean, I think your kids were small enough. Like, I mean, when I think of it right now, like one is a high schooler and can I go eat at this stage or not is my challenge, you know? But when you were, I mean, of course you traveled throughout their different stages in life. So how did you manage to do that with the kids? And, you know, like what was the impact on them? How hard or easy was it for them to adjust to those new environment as well? Yeah. And again, everybody's different. Right. And I, I don't know if I would make the same decision if my kids were in high school. Right. That was um, that they're they're formed and they have friends and they have, you know, I, I wasn't there. You know, my family, we weren't the whole world to them. Right. They were in preschool or whatever. But OK, um, I think. My personal experience, so one was 18 months, 17 months and one was four hadn't been in kindergarten yet or any of the U.S. school system. Um, but because my husband's French, as I mentioned, and because I have always traveled to Europe, I, it didn't, it didn't, I wasn't worried enough to think it was going to be detrimental. Now, 
I put them in French schools right away. Not that they spoke French, but I thought, let's just, you know, they're, they're young. They're not, you know, they're, and again, they were healthy. So this is all out of, you know, my own context. So don't take what I say as, as something to go do for yourself, but they were healthy, you know, thriving. They've heard French. My husband spoke French to them. So it wasn't, it was, it was tough. I mean, there was a tough challenge when I put my four, you know, the four-year-old into the, the school system there. And by the time, well, you know, she was seven or eight when we came back. Yeah, I remember the first sort of report card from the teacher was like, you know, she, she's not doing well. She's not speaking. I'm like, well, duh, she just got here. You can't expect her to speak and write perfect French. She just got here, you know, like six months ago. Although, you know, she's great at it now. It's probably why she's in Montreal. It's It's changed her course of life, right? Because she speaks French. She's in a now a very international city that appreciates, and it's multicultural. I mean, they've got, she loves the multicultural aspect of it. She's got friends from every country in the world, scientists, of course, as you know, Arshna, they're, they're, they come to these great schools, she's at McGill, to learn and, and develop. And I think by having her in a multicultural environment when she was little, that changes your brain, it changes how you think. So, you know, it depends on what you aspire to for your family life and your and your kids. I know my my mom and dad were like, you're what? We didn't even have FaceTime then, you know? So <laughs> they couldn't even see them, but we came home a lot, right? So you came home, we came home every six months or something like that. So they were able to see him. We sent videos. So there's different, you know, the personal, the, the kid thing is, is, um, is a very personal decision and it really can be very disruptive, but it, that's why you need partners to help you do that, friends and family, to, to make sure that when that disruption does happen, you can, you know, I, I actually, um, to be truthful, I brought a nanny with me. I was lucky enough to be able to afford that and brought somebody with me because it was a lot. I was afraid, right? I didn't know. Um, I'd probably bring one again if I if I had little kids. I think it's important to be able to have, such, again, a trusted partner to help you speak the language or go to the grocery store because because you're invested so much in the job. And I was, I was actually having to travel every week. So I was in France and having traveled to another site. So I was leaving. Not only did I bring them to another country, then I left them every Monday <laughs> to Friday to go to another site and would come back on the weekend. So my husband was amazing. Um, right. So, so it's important to understand the 360 of that again, what do you, you know, yeah. um, in hindsight, awesome decision, definitely some risky things in there, but really, I don't, I, I, we can ask them, but I think they, they will have memories and, um, things they will do in the future that probably resemble that because that's how they learned. Okay. There's tons of stories from those days. I, I remember, you know, crying because the work was so hard, you know, going mm -hmm. out of the office and just thinking, how on earth am I going to do this? Um, and then going back in and pretending like it was fine. You know, it's just, just sort of things that happen because because situations are, are difficult. But um, but it, it really. It really makes you stronger and, and smarter and much more resilient to like when things come at you, you take a deep breath and go, okay, I've seen that before, or I haven't seen that before. So it's weird. Let me think about that for a minute before emotionally or overreacting to certain things that get thrown your way. It, I really do think that international, I mean, I would say yes, a hundred percent again. And I, if you can make it happen, go do it um, without you know, again, your own personal situation. But for me, that would be my, that's been my mantra all along. Wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I? That's exciting. Fantastic. I see you smiling because I know you're yes. just the travel guru and, <laughs> you know, you're out there all the time with new experiences. Yes. And, yes. I can't you know. think of one negative uh, that you can have out of traveling in your life. It's always a learning. And even when you are mugged in the middle of a street, it's still there's some learning. <laughs> which you can bring back, you know, to your professional as well as personal life. So Jennifer, with that, I think we wanted to ask you one, like, you know, you already shared so many, but like to our viewers who are emerging women leaders, if there is one advice you would like to give or something, you know, you wish you had known when you were younger, something like that, if you would like to, like, you know, um, give one advice to our women data professional emerging leaders and listeners. Yeah. yeah. Um, easy. And this is not a sales pitch. So 
I don't mean it this way, but when I was younger, nobody told me I could have a coach. Nobody told me it was okay to ask questions. Nobody told me it was okay to ask for help. Nobody. It was like, do it yourself, figure it out. Of course, I lived in that world. My mother was a nurse, figure it out. You know, you know, so this is how I grew up. But in the corporate world, I wish somebody said, I can help you, let me help you, or do you need help? And that didn't seem to be the model back then. Maybe it's a little bit more now, but I, I think destigmatizing, asking for help is a very important thing. And having a coach can help you um, figure out how to be okay with that. Asking for a coach is a very good thing to ask for right now because it can be part of your learning and development plan for the year, professional type of development. It doesn't have to be data specific out of your data budget and everybody gets all worked up because you're spending data money on your professional, personal development. But a coach helps you reach your highest potential in whatever you're doing. And often, and you guys know, right, data is a lonely place sometimes. The chief data officer role, when people don't fully understand it or they've got their own expectations of what that is, you can't often go to somebody in your organization and have a real heart to heart about where things are right and wrong because they just hired you as the chief data officer and you're supposed to know everything. And you know, you hired you on Monday, on Thursday, all the data is good, even after 60 years of bad behavior with data. Um, so I, I, I just feel like having a coach used to be reserved for executive coaching and you know, the executive who needed it. And often it meant you had interpersonal relations. You know, oh, you're not speaking right to your people. So we're going to help you just be more professional or whatever that is, that's, that's gone. Like it should be destigmatized. It should be part of everybody's development plan. You should have a coach. It should be, you know, HR people should be trained in how to coach leaders. Team leaders should know, be trained in how to coach, hire a coach, whatever you need to. And if your coach doesn't have a coach, change your coach, right? Cause everybody deserves that. Not, not a hundred percent all the time, but when you need something like that and you want to have a sounding board or some, spitballing ideas about approaches or how to approach a certain audience when you're trying to get your communication points across. How, can I try those out on you role-playing? Safest place, trust, safe, doesn't go out of that. And you can do it in Zoom or, or Teams or whatever video system you wanna use. And it just changes, it opens up a whole new world for you by having access to that. So that would be the one thing I would say now I wish somebody let me do that, told me I could do that, would have paid for that um, back then. Oh, and I should say the, the manager that I had at the time, and, and you know her, Pashesti, um, I became an executive coach through GE, through the manager that I worked for, because I went to her and I said, I feel like this is something I want to do. And she let me do that. So if you ask, and it was a woman, so maybe it's different, but it, I asked her and she's like, I think that's a great idea. Go do that. So that's how it started. Many, many years ago, I became an executive coach. And um, I, think, I think back then it was still stigmatized as, oh, there must be something wrong. You need help if you're going to do that. It shouldn't be. My, my, my mission is to destigmatize asking for help and getting coaching for data leaders, for executive leaders, for business people, men, women alike, imposter syndrome, whatever that is, you know, this can help. Like a cliche to ask you one advice, but I already noted down like seven, eight, nine advices, right? Your clear framework, your maturity, how you mature as a female leader um, in terms of handling, uh, you know, difficult situations and difficult leaders. And uh, I'm so impressed that you come from a background, luckily and fortunately, where you had females in your own family, like your mother, who was a nurse, and your daughters, who kind of inspired you. And, uh, you know, particularly for me, it was really, really important to learn, and I'm sure for all our viewers as well, that there are all positives of relocation. And you obviously had the biggest male ally, your husband, who supported you, because I feel like where females are today, we need other females, but we also need male allies who would support sure, sure. us to, you know, get us to the next step of where we want to see our community and society be at, right? So that's definitely very fortunate for you. And I'm fortunate that way too, with my father and my husband. Um, and lastly, I would say, get a coach, destigmatize their entire idea. And that's something that we love to love 
talk more and more on that. Yeah, so uh, Jennifer, it was really inspiring and I learned a lot. You know, I'm sure our viewers will find it extremely interviewing as well. So on behalf of WDP team, uh, Prasasti, and I would like to thank you for taking your valuable time to spend with us and share all these life experiences that are, you know, really, really important as we move on in our career ladder or in our personal life too, right? A lot of learning. So thank you so much for your time. You're, you're very welcome. If you want to, anybody can reach out to me, find me on yes. LinkedIn or, or anywhere. Happy to have calls. They can reach out to me. I respond to, to that really quickly. And I really enjoyed speaking with you ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.